Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Biodiesel Magazine's webinar on biodiesel technology, enhancing profit through new processing techniques. My name is Ron Cutterba. I'm the editor of Biodiesel Magazine, and I'm pleased to have you all with us this afternoon. Our webinar today is sponsored by Methus Energies. There's no question that the biodiesel industry is wonderfully diverse in many respects. From the myriad of feedstocks used, to the scale and business models of production facilities, to the variety of technologies used for reaction, pretreatment, and fuel washing, and everything else in between. Biodiesel has always been a thin margin business, and with the policy uncertainty that has defined this year particularly, never has it been more important to be able to process lower cost, lower quality feedstock with new technologies, as well as optimize conventional technologies with new techniques. It is for this reason we are holding this webinar today and why so many of you have tuned into the broadcast. Uh, we do anticipate time for a Q&A session after all of our speakers have presented today, so if you do have a question for one or all of them, please use the window pane on the right side of your screen to send it to us. I'm pleased to have four experts with us today, Nicholas Ng with Methes Energies, Permunk Nielsen with Novozymes, Will Smith with Springhouse Consulting, and former Texas Tech professor Uzi Mann. Before we uh, begin the presentations, however, we'd like to pause for a brief word from our sponsor, Methes Energies. Today's webinar is brought to you by Methes Energies. Methes Energies is an experienced and highly respected player in the growing biofuels industry. Founded in 2004, the company markets biodiesel solutions targeted at small and medium-scale biodiesel producers. Using its own technology, Methus Energies is also a high-quality biodiesel producer. Our flagship product, the Denami 600, was the first truly compact, fully automated, state-of-the-art, continuous-flow biodiesel processor able to run on a wide variety of feedstocks. The Denami 600 is the most reliable and cost-effective method of producing quality, top-grade B100 biodiesel which meets or exceeds current ASTM standards in 1.3 million gallon per year increments. Because of its small footprint and unique modular design, the Denami 600 makes it very easy to increase your production. You can start small and add additional units to your site later. Smart growth is also an important ingredient of any successful business. The Denami 600 is, is also a fast-to-market solution. Manufacturing is only 16 weeks. Visit our website, www.methus.com. Again, that's methus.com to find out more about how you can benefit from our technology and, more importantly, our experience at Methus. Our main focus is our client's success. Thank you, Ron. Back to you. All right. Our first presenter today is Nicholas Ng, president and co-founder of Methes Energies. Nick is going to talk about a new pretreatment process Methes Energies is debuting today here on our broadcast. And we're proud to have him here to share this new technology with uh, all of you through our forum. Nick, thanks for being here, and welcome to the show. Thanks, Ron, uh, and everybody on the call for taking the time off your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, my name is Nicholas Ng, and I'm the president of Methods Energies. Now, today I'm very excited to share with you our new and innovative way to pre-treat high FFA feedstock with Methods PP MBC catalyst. Our new process will also lower your overall catalyst cost, even if you're currently using only virgin feedstock and not pre-treating. Now, before I get into the details of this new technology, I'd like to introduce methods to the people that do not know us yet, who we are, where we come from, and what we do. Methods Energies was founded in 2004 by myself and John Lowen, our VP of Operations. We are a publicly traded company listed on the NASDAQ under the symbol MEIL. We started with a small vision to install and operate a small biodiesel facility. It was going to be easy, right? No. We found out very quickly that there is no support available for 
small producers, no commercial equipment that is viable at that scale, and there's a lot of testing and a lot of compliance requirements. We had to do it ourselves, and we had to do it right. We felt that there was a much bigger need than supplying good quality equipment to small producers. Now, there are many aspects of the business, for example, feedstock procurement, biodiesel testing, logistics, R&D, that a small producer need help with. Our vision grew bigger, and we decided that Methods Energies will not only be a biodiesel producer, but a supplier of good technology and other services that will make our clients successful. We've designed and built the first fully automated, state-of-the-art, continuous flow biodiesel processor. We called it the Dynami 600. It produces at a rate of 600 liters an hour and is equivalent to 1.3 million gallons a year. We've, we've installed one Dynami 600 in Mississauga, Ontario in 2009. Shortly after that, we added to our product line the Dynami 3000, which is a scale-up of the Dynami 600 and it produces biodiesel at a rate of 6.5 million gallons a year. We have installed two Dynami 3000 in our Sombra, Ontario facility, and we are currently a BQ 9000 producer and marketer of biodiesel. Now, in addition, we have also developed an accounting software to help biodiesel producers manage their books to reporting and track feedstock as required by the EPA. Now, the picture on the left is our 1.3 million gallon per year facility in Mississauga, Ontario. One dynamic six times installed with indoor tanks in the commercial plaza. So we're at unit number five, so I've got navels on, on both sides. So this unit requires only one operator, uh, which mainly do receiving and shipping functions. And the plant runs 24, 24 by seven, uh, unattended overnight and over the weekends. Now, the picture on the right is our 13 million gallon per year plant in Sombra, Ontario. We've got two Dynami 3000 installed with outdoor storage tanks, uh, some rail spurs uh, on the 22 acre site. Now, almost all our inbound and outbound shipments are done with rail. And in addition, we have also installed uh, an acid esterification process to handle feedstock up to 12% FFA. And we use sulfuric acid. Um, to, um, uh, to do our pre-treatment uh, at this site. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> just a little bit more about the equipment. On the left is the Dynami 600, and on the right is the Dynami 3000, both very small footprints. These machines are very reliable, and it produces ASTM using the traditional two-stage transit certification process, equipped with a dry wash system with a two-stage methanol recovery process. Now, in summary, Methods Energies is a very unique uh, company in that we focus in helping smaller values of facilities. We're just not a group of engineers designing equipment, but we also produce market and sell biodiesel. So we understand the market, the feedstock supply uh, issues, the compliance requirements of the biodiesel industry. We saw a very big need in the industry to be able to properly pre-treat lower quality feedstock. We have been evaluating existing and new methods, uh, ranging from solid catalysts to enzymes to supercritical. Uh, many are costly to implement or uh, is, a, is a nightmare to uh, operate consistently. Today, I'm very excited to introduce this new pre-treatment process, which is one easy to operate. It produces consistent results, and it will lower your catalyst cost between 8 to 10 percent. So we have tested this product, uh, this process on many feedstocks, up to 70 percent FFA, that's 70 percent FFA. Uh, we've been focusing primarily on solving some of the key issues in using crude corn oil from ethanol plants. Uh, as many of you know, the supply of corn oil from ethanol plants is growing and it will play a big part in the future of biodiesel industry. Now, there are two major problems using crude corn oil, or even crude soybean and canola oil. Uh, they are waxes and colored. And for many ethanol plants which produces corn oil in between the one to three million gallon range, 
it does not make sense to install a traditional degumming and de-waxing system and then produce biodiesel as red in color. Many biodiesel producers, um, many biodiesel uh, purchases, they shy away from the red color because it looks like dyed diesel and it's unsuitable for on-road use. Now, distillation will remove color completely, but it has a very high cat ice and you loss. Our pretreatment process using the PPMEC catalyst will remove the waxes, change the color of cornwall um, feedstock in one step. Of course, our process is not only limited to crude cornwall, but many other feedstocks like crude soybean oil and canola, and you don't have to degum them, uh, use cooking well, animal fats, and FSA distillates up to 70% FSA. So how does this work? Well, we have to use a high pressure reactor to perform our reaction. The operating temperatures are less than 480F, which is about 250 degrees C, and it operates less than 1,000 PSI. We've seen typical reaction times between 5 to 15 minutes. So depending on the feedstock, it, it can range. But we have seen reactions uh, complete as early as five minutes. Step one, we will add all our ingredients into the reactor. And I like to call this a big pressure cooker. We will add oil, which can be up to 70% free fatty acids. It needs to be dry, well, less than 0.2% water. So to put in your methanol. Uh, and a very small amount of the PPMDC catalyst, less than 1,000 ppm, which is equivalent to about 0.1% of the feedstock oil. Now, since the reaction complete in less than 15 minutes, we don't need a very big pressure cooker to make this work. And after 15 minutes, what we'll get is crude biodiesel and glycerin. Now the biodiesel that is produced in this in, in this stage um, has a high amount of monos and diglycerides. However, all the triglycerides and free fatty acids have been converted. And as you can see from the previous picture that I've shown you, after this process, there's a significant color change from the corn oil feedstock over to uh, the pre-treated oil. Now the glycerin and at this stage can be decanted off for methanol removal and filtering, and the biodiesel needs to be reacted further with sodium methylate. Now one of the most important benefits in this process is that there are zero soaps created at this stage. And at this stage, 90% of your glycerin production is, is done here, which is very clean and easy to refine at a later stage. Now next, we will separate, after we separate out the glycerin from the biodiesel, we really like the fact that the separation in this stage is very clean. We do not have to deal with an emulsion layer. Okay? We can maximize our biodiesel yield by leaving some of the glycerin in the biodiesel and then further reacting it with a base catalyst. I mean, this example will use uh, sodium methylate. And this is very good because you don't need to install additional hardware for downstream recovery of FFA and soaps. The final stage would be the base uh, transit certification process. What we'll do is after we begin the glycerin off, we will add about 1% by weight of sodium methylate into the mixture and this would be the second stage of the base-based transfer certification step uh, in, an, uh, in an existing value plant. And this reaction can be completed in less than 15 minutes. And once that's done, you'll be able to send this biodiesel off to be polished either using a dry wash resin like we have in our plant, in our system, or a water wash. So in summary, um, it will take about 15 minutes to pre-treat and 15 minutes to complete the, the second stage reaction before sending the biodiesel out to polishing. 
and this greatly reduces what the time it takes for uh, the reaction to complete. The downstream part of the, the process is unaffected uh, with, with this new process. In fact, uh, with, with the amount of waxes that is removed, the downstream water washing and the polishing steps are, uh, are, are much easier. So next, I would like to touch on the economics of producing biodiesel and how our pretreatment process using our PPMEC catalyst can lower biodiesel production costs. Now feedstock cost typically it makes up 85% of the total cost of biodiesel production. So definitely being able to use lower cost feedstock will add the most value to the bottom line. Now I have categorized the feedstocks into three groups. The low FSA group which includes the refined or crude begun soya and canola. Now these feedstocks are really good for biodiesel production. The supply is consistent in quality and quantity, but is the most expensive feedstock to use. The second group is the, the crude corn oil from ethanol plants, the yeast cooking oil, and the animal fat. These oils are primarily used in the feed industry and it will require a considerable amount of pretreatment before it can be converted into biodiesel. And of course, the last category is a really high FSA stuff. Uh, I have only put down three uh, FSA distillates and not brown grease um, because FSA distillate supply is just more consistent. And the last category uh, will require the most amount of pretreatment. And in all, in all three categories, the PPMEC catalyst will be able to handle all the feedstock and reduce the catalyst cost at the same time. Now looking at these costs, it, it is obvious that if you could produce biodiesel from corn oil and the yeast cooking oil and FSA distillate uh, would be the best way to go, but you do have to take a look at your conversion ratios because our experience is that not all feedstocks are the same and our experience with crude corn oil and yeast looking on animal fat, um, we've got a conversion uh, yield loss of between 4 to 8 percent um, versus the, um, the the really nice uh, virgin feedstock which is uh, has a yield loss of between 1 or 2 percent. Now as for the catalyst cost, um, the reason why we are confident we can reduce the cost of producing biodiesel through reducing your catalyst cost is that we are using such a low quantity of our PPMEC catalyst. In our example over here, the, the, the first stage uses only 1,000 ppm of the PPMEC, which is 0.1% uh, of the feedstock rate plus an additional 1% sodium methylate to complete the reaction. Now a typical biodiesel plant using uh, virgin feedstocks uh, will require about 4% dosage rate. So we are es essentially reducing the sodium methylate usage by almost 75%. And we're confident that using the PPMEC catalyst, any biodiesel plant, whether you're doing um, Virgin feedstocks, you are currently pre-treating with sulfuric acid or with resin, we can help you save at least up to 10% of your existing catalyst cost. Now in closing, for more information, please visit our website at www.method.com backslash pretreatment and to request for more information, please email ppmec at methods.com. Thank you. Ron, I'll pass the mic uh, back to you. Okay, great presentation, Nick. Thanks for sharing uh, all of that great information with us. Uh, we have gotten a few questions uh, that we'll uh, be asking uh, later in the broadcast when we get to our Q&A uh, session. Uh, but appreciate that. Again, if you have any questions for Nick or for our subsequent, uh, excuse me, our subsequent presenters, uh, feel free to send them through our question pane on the right hand of your screen. 
and uh, we'll try to get uh, to as many of those as possible uh, in our allotted time. Our next speaker today is uh, Per Monk Nielsen. Uh, per Monk is the Senior Science Manager with Novozymes R&D Group, uh, Bioenergy Opportunities. Uh, per Monk is going to talk about uh, Novozymes' significant efforts in commercialization of enzymatic biodiesel production, a new uh, technology that we've uh, heard a lot about in uh, recent, uh, uh, recent months and, and recent years. Uh, per Monk, thanks for joining us today. We're pleased to have you here. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me into this uh, webinar. I'm very happy to be able to present to you our enzyme uh, catalyzed process for producing biodiesel. Um, we have, uh, over the years, uh, worked a lot with, with uh, enzymatic biodiesel, trying to come up with a cost-efficient uh, uh, process, and we really believe uh, that time is up now. Uh, as uh, you may uh, know, we have worked uh, intensively with some partners in production scale, and we have the process uh, now, uh, produced uh, something like more than 1,300 uh, batches uh, of, of biodiesel. So we feel confident that this is uh, ready to, to hit the road, and uh, we will uh, uh, do a, what we will see, say is an official launch in, uh, in the industry uh, uh, by the next uh, couple of months. Um, I trust that most of you know about NoScience, so I won't go into details here. But uh, I, I feel that uh, NoScience is uh, already having a already having a very good foot in the in the bioethanol industry, and we hope uh, to uh, be very significant player also now in, in the biodiesel uh, production. Um, so let me see how. We change the size here. Yeah, uh, the agenda look like uh, looks like this. Uh, I will go into the the, the process uh, very much in technical details and try to explain how it's uh, it's working, uh, the the chemistry around it, and also explain uh, how um, how we can uh, handle any type of of, uh, of oil independent on the free fatty acid uh, content. Uh, that is a very nice feature with, with this process uh, that you can actually use uh, whatever is uh, available without thinking about the uh, free fatty acid content. There are different ways of working with the, with, uh, with the reactors. <coughs> I'll shortly pre uh, touch upon that. And then I also will uh, need to mention some downstream uh, process alternatives as uh, the, the process itself is not done only with, with enzyme. There will be there have to be some uh, uh, some downstream processing also. <clears throat> uh, in brief, uh, the process looks uh, like this. Uh, we have uh, an enzymatic reaction, which is uh, the reactor uh, filled with uh, the oil, and uh, we add the methanol and, uh, and our enzymes. We actually add a little bit of water, which uh, might appear strange to, to most of the biodiesel producer, where you normally need to dry the oil all that you can. Uh, the enzyme is uh, it likes uh, to have a little bit of water around, and that can of course be utilized uh, for the uh, feedstock preparation. You don't need to dry the oil completely. You don't need to rectify the methanol uh, to completely dryness, uh, and also we don't uh, have high uh, methanol concentrations in the in the reactor. So there's some advantages uh, for the enzyme uh, able to operating at the, uh, some water content. <clears throat> so the, there's a pre-treatment of oil which will be filtering and, and getting the worst dirt out of it. And uh, I'll come back to, to uh, some details on that also. Then after the reaction, um, we have uh, what we call the recovery of the fame and, and the enzyme. Even if it's a liquid enzyme, we're actually able to uh, uh, recover it and, and reuse uh, for the coming batches. But uh, what's also required after the reaction is to uh, uh, do a purification of the fame, taking care of uh, approximately 2% free fatty acids left in the uh, in the fame after the reaction. So for that, uh, we on this drawing suggest a caustic wash. There are alternatives which I will touch upon later on. Now into some uh, more details on the process. Uh, this is a little uh, uh, loaded with information, but. Uh, it tells uh, in the bottom left you can see the just a brief scheme of the reaction uh, of the reaction going on. We convert uh, the glycerides and we convert the uh, free fatty acids. Uh, it both uh, both 
types of substrates and, and are handled by the by the enzyme. Um, at all time, we have a, a certain concentration of enzyme in the reactor. We add the methanol gradually over time. We operate at low temperature, 95 Fahrenheit, and we have here mentioned the 2% of water as appropriate uh, on, on, on the content of the tank. And then we have a relatively long uh, reaction time of uh, 20 to 24 hours. Uh, during the reaction, it's uh, required to keep the reactor emulsify the water phase with the enzyme it has to be emulsified uh, uh, during the reaction. Um, I'll turn to the pretreated oil. Uh, the pretreatment besides the filtering and, and what you would like to, to eliminate the dirt and all this kind of things, we have discovered that uh, a sensible thing for the enzyme is not to uh, meet uh, low pH substances uh, in the in the reactor. And low pH substances, that's not free fatty acids, but rather uh, if the oil um, raw material contains some uh, mineral acids, we have to uh, neutralize that. For that sake, we uh, typically add uh, 50 ppm of sodium hydroxide, just enough to uh, make a, a pinch of, of, of soap, but uh, it will handle the, uh, the mineral acids, which will otherwise inactivate the enzyme over time if, if the pH in the water phase becomes too low. So that's an important control point for the uh, pretreatment. That is uh, to make sure mineral acid is, uh, is neutralized. Then we have an enzyme addition, and we have a water tank shown here on the drawing. The water tank is uh, used for for batch number one. Um, when we recycle batch number two, we take out the uh, enzyme, which is present as an emulsion phase uh, between the flame and the glycerin. We can separate that off and uh, use for the next batches. It's shown in the in the drawing in the bottom how we will reuse the enzyme and typically purge 10% uh, of uh, of the emulsion phase. Uh, and by uh, by that also we will lose some enzyme, of course. But we would like to get some uh, build up of recycled material, give that a chance to to get out of the system. So that's uh, why we have this purge of emulsion. Uh, the enzyme reaction and, and inactivation, uh, you know that uh, enzymes are, are reacting faster and faster with a higher temperature, and you can see that on uh, curve A. And the curve B on the drawing here is showing an inactivation rate. That means that the enzyme is uh, suffering if the temperature becomes too hot, and then it uh, eventually it will die off. And uh, if you combine these two reaction curves, you have a reaction curve uh, the C, which is actually telling uh, the maximum speed of the reaction is at what this drawing called the optimum temperature. That's actually not why we operate. We go a little bit further. We select the temperature of 95 Fahrenheit because uh, we, at that time, has a good compromise between a fast reaction and the, in the enzyme will survive. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, why we choose the temperature. I mentioned about the emulsion, so we need efficient mixing. We have to have this 2% uh, water and whatever is uh, produced of glycerin. We have to uh, emulsify that uh, and uh, let the enzyme uh, work in the small droplets. The enzyme works on the interface uh, in the droplets. I show here drawing a graph showing uh, what happens with the uh, reaction rate as we increase the enzyme concentration at um, uh, at the x-axis. And you can see in the beginning with a very little enzyme we will have a significant effect of increasing the, uh, the enzyme doses until a certain level. Then it uh, flattens out and you will do, don't get a uh, quicker reaction when uh, when you add more enzyme. So there is uh, of course a, a, a sweet spot there to, to add the amount of enzyme required and uh, not uh, do more than, than you actually need. Um, Another way of looking at it, you could say if you're for a fixed enzyme uh, uh, doses, you can uh, mix more and more efficient. And we have a curve here showing uh, how much energy input in a certain system on the x-axis uh, is showing the bound glycerin after uh, the reaction time that you, uh, you have settled. So we can see there's an effect of the mixing, and that's uh, what takes uh, the enzyme into contact with the, with the substrates. If we look closer to these um, droplets here, 
We can see uh, the drawing where we have shown the oil phase with the glycerides, the free fatty acids. And in the droplet, the blue droplet here, we have shown the, the water, the methanol, uh, the glycerin, and the, the blue pigment are shown to, to be the, the PV enzyme. The enzyme is located here on the, um, the, on the, on the interface, as I mentioned before. That's very important to, to be aware of. It's actually sitting there and uh, taking substrate uh, uh, from the oil phase. Uh, and here's an illustration of saying what is happening if we really have this uh, acid, with, if we don't pre-treat properly. It, we see on the graphs here two corn oil samples uh, where we have um, a film uh, after 20 hours, uh, more than 90% in the corn oil A and uh, just uh, about 60 on the corn oil B. These were not added uh, costed. And uh, the other set of curve here show very well that uh, the effect of adding just a pinch of uh, sodium hydroxide. In this case, we got the neutralization as, as we uh, wanted it. Then I just want to show you also some uh, data, a typical set of data, what is happening in the, in the reaction. You see uh, the, the triglycerides is uh, reduced very, very fast in the beginning. We see monoglyceride build up, and uh, we see FFA is also increasing in the beginning. Uh, from in this case, it tends to uh, to 17 percent, and then it fades off again, and will arrive uh, typically around 2 percent in, in a normal reaction. So that's uh, these are the the numbers uh, uh, by which we can control and see the the reaction is proceeding as it should. To sum up on the pretreatment, uh, we uh, focus uh, mostly on the mineral acids. That's, uh, that's the most important point here, uh, which we uh, can easily neutralize with sodium hydroxide. Then there can come other stuff in with, uh, with oil, which is uh, not necessarily uh, disturbing the enzyme, but can have an impact on the, on the separation afterwards. And that is, for instance, phospholipids, uh, which uh, is uh, should be taken away by a pretreatment wash. Um, uh, and then we typically uh, suggest that um, a heat stock or raw material should be checked for, for uh, emulsifiers by a settling, uh, settling test. Uh, you can uh, see uh, how, how good the, the oils uh, separate after you mix it with water and let it, let it settle. If it separates quickly on its own, it doesn't have the emulsifier and will not create problems later on. We also mentioned here the unsaponifiable matter. Of, uh, that is a, a general thing, of course, not only for enzymes, but if it's containing unsaponifiable, it will stay uh, as not be converted to vitamins. Uh, it's not as such uh, disturbing the enzyme again. And the same with, with sulfur compounds, if you go uh, on brown grease, uh, the sulfur itself does not impact the enzyme, but of course it has an importance uh, on the specification of the biodiesel. I've chosen to, to take one example here, a high free fatty acid uh, uh, raw material, uh, palm fatty acid distillate, where we uh, uh, get around the fact that the distillate, palm fatty acid distillate melts at a high temperature, 122, and we are operating at 95. Uh, th in this case, it's actually just uh, uh, the technique is set up so that we uh, make a, a continuous steer. The tank reaction can be done uh, the very best way, but in this case, we don't, did a fed batch where we have the operation going on at 95 Fahrenheit and we feed at 122 Fahrenheit the oil and in that way we can uh, convert the PFAD before it uh, crystallizes. So uh, we have done that in also large uh, scale now and we get the 2.7% uh, free fatty acid out of the reactor even coming in with 85% free fatty acid. So a very nice example, I think, that uh, showing that uh, high free fatty acid is uh, not a, a problem for the enzyme. Uh, on this slide, I'll show you a, a picture on the heavy phase um, separation. It is a very nice, uh, clear uh, uh, looking uh, oil, which is uh, refined soybean oil. And after our, our reaction, you have a faint phase, an emulsion layer, and a glycerin water. 
Did you saw a lot you could say that the emulsion layer is actually collecting more than 95% of the enzyme from the reactor. And by uh, getting that out separately, you can recover the enzyme and uh, reuse it, which will lower the, the cost. There are several um, options of operating the reactors. Um, one is to use only a, a few patches uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, recycle all heavy phase. For instance, three patches. We have made an enzyme dosage uh, use rate will be 0.26 when you use this uh, strategy based on uh, initial addition and then uh, a top up uh, in the two other following batches. The advantage of this uh, three batch uh, system is uh, there's no problem with enzyme recovery out of an emulsion. You leave the emulsion and the glycerin in the reactor and just uh, collect the fame and uh, before we add the new raw material. So um, in that way, we can uh, get a, a pretty quick uh, turnover on our capacity. And uh, we have an easy separation and easy downstream pro processing. Alternative is, of course, if you want to save an enzyme, you can do multiple batches. Uh, in this case, we calculated 10 batches. We have seen uh, our partners doing much more than that. But uh, in this example, you get the enzyme use rate of 0.17%. Uh, that uh, requires better separation technology after the reactor to, to operate like that, but, uh, uh, but the, uh, the advantage is, of course, a lower enzyme consumption. Um, I just want to touch upon the, the downstream uh, processing. Uh, we have suggested a caustic wash known from refining where the neutralized uh, free fatty acids is uh, recycled and, and uh, used again at after acidification. That's uh, how the, uh, our partners have been operating. Alternatively is uh, using a resin esterification. Uh, the advantage is production of fame from free fatty acids, so I also believe that is a, a good way to go. Others might choose the sulfuric acid esterification, um, uh, which also make Fame out of free fatty acids, but and then this is established process. And then lastly, uh, enzymatic esterification. Uh, that is uh, where we wanted it really to be, but we have not, uh, no science, been able to make the immobilized enzyme cheap enough uh, to to be efficient on that one. It will really require a immobilized enzyme to do uh, a free fatty acid down to 0 0.22, 25 percent uh, on on such a step. But that will probably come, but uh, not as uh, uh, from us right now, at least. So my conclusion is that uh, our process now has uh, shown successful uh, in, in, in production scale by more than 1,300 batches. It is a free fatty acid independent process. Uh, that means you can shop around lower cost feedstocks, uh, doing 15% FFA one day and 85 the other day. It doesn't matter for the process. Um, we have lower methanol rectification costs. We add less in the, during the reaction, and we don't need to dry the recovered methanol up again. We can use it wet in uh, in the next batch. And then we also seen that the, the capex for plant retrofits and constructions uh, are uh, relatively low to to normal uh, construction uh, costs. And uh, lately, uh, lastly, I would also like to, to point that, that several plants uh, are under construction besides the ones already have been in operation for, for more than a year now. <clears throat> so by that, uh, I will uh, hand the words back to, to Ron. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pramanka, uh, for that well put together presentation. I've uh, got several questions for you that have been coming through. Uh, Thank you very much. Next up, we have Will Smith, who many of you may know from his work with Pacific Biodiesel. Uh, Will was instrumental in uh, many of the technologies that play at Pacific Biodiesel's Big Island Biodiesel plant. Now, Will is the principal at Springhouse Consulting. Will, we're glad to have you with us today. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Ron, and, and thanks to, to Methus for sponsoring this webinar and to everyone for, for taking the time to attend. Um, I'm going to be doing something a little different uh, with this presentation. Um, Springhouse Consulting provides uh, independent engineering consulting services to, uh, to several 
uh, industries in, in biodiesel and related to biodiesel. And when Ron and I decided uh, to, for me to be a panelist in the webinar, I decided to do a survey of different technologies that emerged and kind of see where they are in their commercialization process. So it's only 15 minutes to do this. This is going to be pretty top level, uh, full comparison we could spend days on. And also a lot of the data that's needed to do detailed comparisons of these technologies just simply isn't available for the public uh, consumption uh, for trade secret reasons. So I'm going to be speaking in some kind of general terms about things like yields and energy consumption, et cetera. Uh, but to start out the survey, I'd like to, to take a quick look at uh, two important market trends in the U.S. biodiesel industry that, uh, that affect decisions about technologies. So most of the body supply capacity in the U.S. was installed from around 2005 to, to 2012, and a lot has changed in the industry since then. Uh, to say things are, are more complicated would be a, a gross understatement. Uh, but one thing has not changed, uh, and that is, is access to cost-effective feedstock is still a paramount issue facing the industry, and, and Nicholas and Promote addressed this very well in their first two presentations. Um, so this has pushed the industry into a direction of, of what I would call non-traditional feedstock. And in this presentation, the term non-traditional feedstock I'm using to refer to feedstock like high free fatty acid, animal fats, uh, yellow grease, you know, used cooking oil, and distiller's corn oil. I prefer the term non-traditional to waste because waste implies that they have no value. And if anybody who's ever tried to purchase one of these feedstock knows they're, uh, they, they're not value zero. So uh, these feedstock have always been part of the feedstock mix in the industry due to their low cost uh, compared to soybean and canola oil. But recent changes like the RFS2 and the California Lower carbon fuel standard has seen the use of these feedstock increase uh, significantly because of their lower life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So on the graph on this page, uh, what you're seeing is the increase in usage of non-traditional feedstock over the last four years. And the trend is pretty indisputable. Um, non-traditional feedstock now represents between 30 and 42 percent of all the feedstock consumed in the U.S. bodies of marketplace. That's according to, to EIA. So going forward, technology selection, which allows processing of these feedstock, will become the norm, uh, if not absolutely essential, for, for producers to, to make it in the marketplace. So the next uh, trend I'd like to look at, one which is not so pleasant to discuss, but also has a major impact on the industry and technology selection, is, is production market trends. And the great majority of U.S. body capacity, which was put in or in the early 2000s, was set up for low free fatty acid feedstock like soy, canola, and low SSA fats. And the rapid upward pressure on the traditional feedstock market um, as a result of all that capacity coming online um, had a huge impact on capacity utilization as a great number of the plants just simply aren't able to complete, compete um, on the available production spread between traditional feedstock and B100. And on this graph, you can see the capacity utilization in the U.S. since 2009, again, pulled from, from EIA data. So on average, in the last five years, capacity utilization has been, been less than 40 percent. So why does this matter? Um, low utilization has resulted in a lot of bankruptcies, um, a lot of consolidations as plants leave the market permanently or consolidate to improve their position of feedstock procurement and offtake. And the end result is that uh, due to the number of insolvencies and idle or distressed assets obtaining traditional capital sources for carrying out new construction retrofits or in some cases even obtaining operating capital is, is very, very challenging, as I'm sure many of the webinar participants are aware. I wanted to raise these points uh, because when we talk about technologies, we, we have to take into account not just the optics, but the capex economics, because even the most efficient and robust process isn't viable if you, if you can't raise the money to put it in. So um, with those two trends in mind, I'd like to jump into the survey, uh, which I've divided into two sections. Uh, one, tr traditional chemistry approaches, which are advanced based on traditional base catalyzed process chemistry, and the new chemistry approaches, which utilize uh, new catalytic techniques to produce methyl esters. So for each approach, I'm going to briefly summarize their advantages and disadvantages and kind of comment on their commercialization status. And again, this is going to be pretty top level and pretty fast. So acid esterification is, is one of the most um, straightforward and kind of one of the older uh, approaches to incorporating non-traditional feedstock. It uses sulfuric acid or in some cases sulfonic acid to esterify free fatty acids to make methyl esters. Uh, it's commercially proven in a great number of plants throughout the world for handling high, level, high levels of free fatty acids. Uh, its chemical costs are relatively low, and very high conversion is easy to achieve, especially when you operate it in multiple steps. Uh, its disadvantages uh, include water sensitivity and slow reaction times, uh, the capital energy costs associated with neutralizing the sulfuric acid as well as recovering the excess methanol can be significant for a plant. Um, it's typically much less capital intensive if the plant was designed with that in mind from the outset, but a lot of times that's not the case. 
And finally, in most cases, there's an issue of disposing of, uh, of a saltwater solution or dry salt uh, that results from the neutralization of the catalyst. So there, there are many providers of this technology, and I do mean many. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of companies that have come and gone um, and a lot of homegrown solutions to it. Uh, but there's been relatively few who've had uh, a lot of commercial references available to visit. Uh, two providers who incorporated this chemistry very early on in their, their process were Pacific Biodiesel, my former employer, and Biodiesel International out of, out of uh, Europe, uh, who between the two of them have 40 plus references, just to give you an idea of uh, how pervasive this is in the industry now. Next uh, process I'd like to talk about is fatty acid stripping. Uh, this is a traditional oleochemical process that removes free fatty acids from a mixed feedstock stream by vacuum distillation. Uh, to produce a, a pure triglyceride stream and a pure fatty acid stream. Um, the advantage of this process is it's very simple. Uh, it's got decades of commercial use in vegetable refining and oleochemicals. Uh, it requires no, no changes to the downstream biodiesel plant, um, no additional chemical usage, 100% of the assets can be reused. Um, and you also have the creation of additional revenue stream by selling the pure fatty acids. The major disadvantage here, of course, is that the free fatty acids are not converted into your most value-added product, biodiesel. Um, it's also relatively expensive to operate with capital operating costs similar to, uh, to biodiesel distillation. Um, and it's not really intended to operate on very high free fatty acid material. It can, it can go as high as 16 to 20 percent free fatty acids, but typical ranges are, are around 5 percent. Uh, technology providers include uh, kind of a who's who of, of oleochemicals, Crown Ironworks, Cement Balestra, Allergy, and St. Bernardini. And it also has good commercial references. Uh, Crown Ironworks has installed uh, over 12 of these units in body cell applications in ranges of 30 to 60 million gallons per year. Glycerolysis is uh, yet another oleochemical process that's found some foothold in biodiesel as a pretreatment step. Um, in glycerolysis, the free fatty acids in the incoming feedstock are first esterified with glycerol to create mono diglyceride before entering a traditional transesterification process. So the advantages here are similar to fatty acid stripping with one big difference. Uh, because the free fatty acids are converted to glycerides, they can enter the downstream biodiesel process and be converted to ester. So like free fatty acid stripping, glycerolysis allows the use of all the downstream plant equipment and doesn't require any additional catalysts, and also allows for, for all the traditional plant equipment to be reused, uh, methanol distillation and, and biodiesel purification. Um, disadvantages of glycerolysis center uh, mainly around the reaction kinetics. Uh, long reaction times are often required, and achieving a complete reaction, i.e. getting it down below 1% free fatty acid, is possible, but requires some very, very careful attention to the process design and operation. So one final issue is the glycerin quality required. Well, it's, uh, it is possible to perform glycerolysis purification and glycerolysis with refiner's crude glycerin, which would be glycerin in the 80% purity range that contains the salt. Um, by all accounts, the presence of that salt complicates downstream purification steps. So technical grade glycerin, i.e. salt-free glycerin, is really the preferred reagent for, for doing this reaction. And that would typically mean the body of the plant needing to have glycerin distillation as part of its plant setup. Uh, providers of the technology include Superior Process, NAC Process Design, E3 Energy Partners, Alpha Laval, Crown Ironworks, and, and several other companies. Um, there's several commercial references available. Um, the former Nova Biosource facilities, one now operated by RAG, um, one by Santa Max, one by Scott Petroleum, all make use of glycerolysis as a pretreatment step in these are at scales of 20 to 60 million gallons per year. Now we'll look at some new chemistry approaches. So heterogeneous metal catalysts, um, as opposed to homogeneous catalysts like sodium ethoxide, uh, do not circulate in the reaction mixture. They're usually um, on fixed beds or, um, or, or immobilized on beads. Uh, there's been an ongoing search for a number of years to find a catalyst which can perform both esterification and transesterification in this manner. And there's been many, many patents filed on this topic, uh, typically based on the use of transition metals like uh, in traditional metal complexes like zinc, lanthanum chromium, nickel. Um, the advantages here are catalysts which can perform simultaneous esterification and transesterification without any catalyst residues in the downstream processes. And that means no emulsions, no soap formation, no, no neutralization steps in the glycerin purification. So you also end up with a very high purity glycerin. Uh, after methanol and water removal, typically 95% uh, or better um, methanol and glycerin quality can be expected. And the body for purification steps are more phase straightforward. You don't have the emulsions to deal with. The disadvantages of heterogeneous catalysts um, are typically elevated levels of excess methanol. 
uh, and higher operating temperatures and pressures, commonly north of, of 400 Fahrenheit and around 800 to 1,000 PSI operating pressures. Uh, this results in higher energy use and capital costs when compared with traditional transit purification. But when you take a step back and you look at retrofitting a, a traditional biodiesel plant with um, sulfuric acid catalysis purification, the greenfield capital costs actually uh, become much more similar. Uh, there's also some variation in requirements for feedstock pretreatment and ester post-treatment, depending upon the technology provider and how the process is applied. Um, you know, the, the quality of the body so coming out of the end of the, pro end of the process as well as what's required to, to put these stuck in the process varies a little bit. And the final unknown here being catalyst life in commercial application and the cost of catalysts or license since these technologies have not really reached commercial scale yet. Uh, providers of heterogeneous catalyst technology include Benefuel, uh, Nextcat, and Biodiesel International. And from Nicholas's presentation today, I guess we, we can include Methus as well. Uh, there's no commercial references in the U.S. available yet, um, but Benefuel's first plant in, in Beatrice, Nebraska is slated to be online in the summer of 2015. Uh, supercritical methanol um, it takes the advantages and disadvantages of heterogeneous cat catalysts um, one step further um, by eliminating catalysts altogether and allowing the reaction to proceed with very large excesses of methanol in a supercritical state. Um, now, there's been several attempts over the years to capitalize on, on a, a real wealth of, of lab-scale work that's been done on this process. Um, the commercial applications always need to be kind of just around the corner um, for whatever reason. Uh, you know, the advantages here are the same as heterogeneous catalysis. Um, you have simultaneous esterification and transesterification. You have no catalyst residues, and you have a very high purity glycerin. Um, but the disadvantages are also similar. Uh, in this case, a little bit magnified. You have very high methanol ratios and very high pressures and temperatures now approaching 800 Fahrenheit and around 3,000 PSI, which result in, in higher capex and energy consumption. Um, reports also vary as to the potential for side reactions to impact final product quality, um, mainly degradation of fatty acid chains and glycerin under prolonged supercritical conditions and formation of, of uh, undesirable compounds. Um, we should also note here that uh, several of the providers for both heterogeneous catalysis and supercritical um, strongly recommend or require uh, biodiesel distillation in order to, to meet all relevant ASTM specifications. Um, the only commercial provider offering supercritical process currently is Jasper Diesel, with several other firms um, kind of having come and gone over the years, including uh, Biofuel Box, which operated a pilot system in Idaho for some time. And the first commercial reference for this process is intended to be a startup by the end of the by the end of this year, 2014, at, at Patriot Biofuels in Illinois, operating on crude corn oil. And it's a, a, a rendering of, of that plant that's in process. Um, enzymatic conversion is the final uh, technology to discuss uh, with goals similar to heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, enzymatic bodies of production seek to achieve the same reactions using naturally derived enzymes as catalysts. And, Ramuk talked about this in great detail during his presentation, so I'm not going to go into much detail here, but uh, the advantages which differentiate enzymatic processing at its core are the very benign reaction conditions and methanol loading compared to all other conversion techniques, which uh, promise to kind of reduce energy and capital costs um, significantly by lowering the equipment energy uh, required to recycle excess methanol. Um, you know, disadvantages of enzymatic processing, uh, again, include the lifespan of the enzyme, which Ramuk spoke to. Um, you know, kind of unknown replacement costs uh, long term, yeah, and then long reactor resonance time in some applications, as well as some difficulty in achieving complete reactions, which uh, Pramunk also mentioned, um, the need for downstream processing uh, in order to bring acid number uh, back into specification. Providers here are, are Novozymes, uh, Piedmont Biofuels, who operates uh, the faster process based on a, a, a mobilized um, lipase uh, and trans bodies. Um, all of these Companies offer variations of the process uh, that are either in, in the marketplace or very close to being in the marketplace. Uh, there's been several successful pilots completed, um, but at least one commercial reference in, in diesel fuel, Florida. Whew, okay, that was quite a whirlwind. So as uh, you might have expected, there's, there's no clear winner here. Uh, there's no champion to crown. Um, you know, each one of these techniques has its, its merits and its, as well as its drawbacks. So I'd like to kind of conclude by talking how you, you might start to choose from this kind of overflowing buffet uh, of different options for plants. So for existing plants, uh, the thing to keep in mind is, is what's your best fit? What makes the best use of your existing plant assets for re from your action system 
all the way through to your plant utilities. So if you have on the ground that you can be reused is what you have uh, in your plant currently, something that you even want to keep. Um, but most importantly, where can any of these retrofits put you from a competition standpoint in, in three to five years when you're trying to get these paid off in a, in a very tough feedstock environment? Um, for new producers, um, if there, there are any on this call, um, there, there, aren't, there aren't that many out there anymore, um, heterogeneous, enzymatic, and supercritical are all getting very, very close to market, um, if, if not uh, breaking down the door. So you have to weigh the advantages of, uh, of you know of waiting or or taking the time uh, you know to, to kind of see how they they pan out or take the plunge down uh, depending upon your appetite for risk um, there's also uh, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation a lot of distressed assets and so there there's there's some uh, potential for finding a unique distressed asset that might be uh, a suitable candidate for retrofit with uh, with one or even multiple of these these different processes The biggest question, uh, the one facing us all, is, is will there be the political and financial will to fund an industry reboot, um, you know, where we get to retrench the lines and, and get more competitive? You know, the question marks over the RFS2 are on everybody's mind. Um, if, you, if you know the outcome of that, please give me a call after the presentation. Um, but for the rest of us, I think we just uh, we have to wait and see. So you know, as you go forward, how do you manage your risk in this decision making? Um, and my, my strongest advice is to take your time. Uh, the industry is littered with uh, dead hairs from the tortoise and hare analogy um, who tried to get rushed to market with a, with a half-baked technology or an incomplete plant um, and then found months in that they couldn't perform, they couldn't compete. So look around and see the companies are that survive. You know, insist on a comprehensive engineering approach, proposal, uh, insist on detailed provided equipment lists, process guarantees, um, and finally for emerging technologies, uh, you need to get some accountability. You need to demand references. You need to demand pilot data, um, even third-party verification of the process plans before you before you start signing deposit checks. And finally, uh, any change you make um, or step you take needs to be viewed as a complete facility picture. You know you have to think very carefully about how any change impacts not just feedstock use and the feedstocks you can bring into the plant, but your final product quality your yield, your utility and chemical consumption, your co-product quality, uh, your value, your waste stream, so cost and security, all of these go together um, in pennies at a time uh, to impact your profitability. Um, that's all I've got. I'd like to, to make a few acknowledgments. This survey took a lot of time in putting together, and I'd like to thank uh, some of the folks for taking uh, their time to help me uh, in talking about their offerings and experiences. Tim Neely with Mac Process Design, Christina Borges with Preprocess, pre Dan Parker at E3 Energy Partners, Chuck Fellay at Mexicat, Bill McDonald, Crown Ironworks, Kirk Cobb at Superior Process Technologies, Tony Wells at Benefuel, and Roger Sally at Jatra Diesel, all, all top-notch folks dedicated to this industry. With that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll pass it back to you, Ron. Hey, thanks, Will. Uh, it's quite an impressive overview, and uh, it's good to see that you re uh, reached out to so many uh, in the industry for your survey. Also, I wish you the best of luck in your new consulting business. Thank you. Uh, yeah, finally today I'd like to introduce uh, Uzi Mann, a retired Texas Tech professor who we featured on the cover of our January-February 2014 issue of Biodiesel Magazine in an article we called Elegant Engineering. Uzi is going to discuss the difficulties of large-scale biodiesel processing and overcoming those difficulties by utilizing new techniques within the currently available technologies. Welcome to the webinar, Uzi. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ron, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, the objective of my talk is that by the, in 15 minutes, by the time I finish the presentation, I would like you to recognize the main difficulties for large-scale large biodiesel production, and I also would like you to become familiar with two methods to overcome these difficulties. I would like also to mention that uh, this presentation is an extension of a published uh, paper or published uh, article in the Biodiesel Magazine in January 2014, and also uh, technical information are provided in the US patent uh, that was published in 2013. Uh, first, uh, a very brief background. I think that uh, the future of the biodiesel industry really depends on its viability in competition with in economic competition 
with uh, petroleum-based uh, diesel fuel. And uh, in order to do it, we have to, to produce biodiesel in, in uh, large-scale production. And of course, we have to recognize that in large-scale large production, small improvements add up to large dollar savings. Uh, also, we have to recognize that a lot of methodologies that are developed in the process industry can be and should be adapted in large-scale uh, biodiesel facilities. Uh, I'm concentrating in this presentation on the trans-esterification part of the process, assuming that the feedstock was treated and is ready for to be uh, converted into a biodiesel. Of course, we have here uh, the trans-esterification reactions. And just a brief review, uh, we are dealing here with three steps reactions. Each step is re reversible. And we also have to recognize that the reactions themselves are endothermic. You see that that will have a very important factor in the consideration. Also, I'm dealing here with conventional approach, where we're using a conventional catalyst like NaOH, KOH, and so forth. The, the first difficulty that we have is that uh, when we try to react the oil and the alcohol, one second. Okay. That uh, the two reactants are immiscible. And uh, the transgressing extrification reactions occurs only at the interface of the two liquid phase reactants. As a result, we have a very slow reaction rate. And a consequence of it is that we need very large tank reactors. Now, we also have to recognize that in order to improve the rate of the reaction, we, we have to increase the interfacial area between the two reactants. Hello. It looks like uh, looks like uh, we we may have lost uh, uh, Uzi for for a moment. Uh, while we uh, wait to get him back, uh, we can go ahead and uh, uh, perhaps uh, start uh, asking some of the questions that we've received. Uh, while we wait for him, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, let's see here. So. This is for, uh, for for Nicholas. Nicholas, if you're available, uh, we've got some questions for you on the uh, PBMEC uh, pretreatment catalyst that you discussed earlier. Uh, where does the produced water go and the glycerin, and how do you take that onto the transesterification step? Well, that's a really, really good question. Um, <clears throat> these are our findings. After the first stage, uh, using the PPMEC catalyst, we did not find water in the glycerin phase, the recovered methanol phase, and the oil phase. Um, and the the, uh, the product coming out from the first stage is suitable for the second stage transit certification as it is. That's all I can tell you so far, and the rest is up to your imagination. All right. Uh, next question, um, Nick. Uh, w what is the typical volume of PPMEC for a five million gallon a year plant? That's fourteen thousand gallons a day. And what's the price of PPMEC? Okay. Uh, instead of going um, fourteen thousand gallons a day, maybe I can give everybody on the call a generic formula. Our dosage rates are zero point one percent. So 
for every 100,000 pounds of feedstock we process, we would require 100 pounds of PPNEC. And based on our calculations, uh, a $37 a pound um, of PPNEC would deliver the 10% savings on the overall catalyst cost um, that you guys are using currently. And um, the, the the price of the catalyst will decrease as um, volumes uh, purchase are increased. Okay. Um, a question for uh, per monk. Uh, per monk, fifty parts per million uh, NaOH is added for enzymatic system. What normality or mole is this? This is uh, this is regarded as 50 ppm of a pure sodium hydroxide, which is then added as is as a dilute uh, solution, like a two percent solution or something like uh, similar to that. So I showed the numbers. Uh, one oil requires 10 ppm uh, sodium hydroxide, but others can require uh, typically 50 ppm. As you go uh, as you go to lower quality of oil, you will often find some. Uh, additives of, of acid uh, present in, in these oils. So 50 ppm sodium hydroxide, that's pure sodium hydroxide. Yeah, now it says we would. In our uh, okay, uh, uh, Uzi, are, are you there? We, we lost you for a minute. Do you hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you now. Uh, you know, we lost you about five minutes ago, so I'm wondering if you can... Uh, okay. Let, yeah. Okay, let, let, let me go back to, okay, to put my presentation on, I would appreciate Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ron, and I'm very, very sorry for any trouble here. Thank you for everybody for your time. Uh, what I would like to do here in my short presentation today is that by the time we finish the presentation, we would like you to be familiar with the main difficulties of large, large biodiesel production. And I also would like you to become familiar with two methods to overcome this issue. And the key thing is the method that I'm going to offer are utilizing current technology. Uh, this presentation is an extension of uh, an article that in Biodiesel Magazine in January, and also uh, details of the technologies are being described in the US patent that were published in 2013. Before I go into the details, I would like to make two general comments. Comment number one is that uh, uh, I believe that the viability of the biodiesel industry depends on its overall economic competitiveness. I'll see you later. Okay. Thank you. We have a welcome. Of the I will. Red diesel. I'm going out with uh, Amy for lunch tomorrow. Hey, just just a moment. Uh, uh, there's someone who does, gets off work at noon. I'm sorry. There's someone who, who doesn't have their phone on mute. If uh, if you can put, mute your phones while uh, Dr. Mann is presenting, we'd appreciate that. Okay. Uh, the second point that, uh, of course, we have to recognize is that large-scale biodiesel, pro large, large biodiesel production, more improvements add up to large dollar savings. And also that uh, we have to apply uh, methodologies that were proven in the chemical process industry to large-scale biodiesel facilities. I'm going to focus on the production of biodiesel by the trans-esterification reaction, assuming that the feedstock has been treated, treated and is ready for the processing. The trans-esterification reaction, of course, it consists of three stages. And the key points to keep in mind is that each stage is a reversible reaction, that the reactions themselves are endothermic, slightly endothermic, and of course, we are using here conventional catalysts like NaOH, KOH, and so forth. Okay, 
the first main difficulty in producing biodiesel is the fact that the oil and the alcohol are immiscible. As a result, the transit stratification reactions cause occur only at the interface of the two phases, and the reaction rate, as a result, is slow and we require very large reactions. You have to keep in mind is that in order to improve the reaction rate, we have to break the methanol into small chunks, and the interfacial area is inversely proportional to the diameter of the droplets. In general, we have to recognize that when, when scaling up, the, more, the larger the, the, the equipment that you have to deal with, that we, it's more difficult to obtain small droplets. And I give here a, a scaling up relationship that you can appreciate why it's difficult. The second difficulty derives from the first one, and it is that since we are carrying out the reaction in big tanks, usually the temperature of the reactor is restricted it should be below the boiling point of methanol, which is around 65 degrees C. Now, at lower temperatures, of course, the, the rate of reaction is slow, and also since the reactions are endothermic, the equilibrium composition is, is favoring the reactants. In practice, usually what we do is, in order to push the equilibrium composition towards the biodiesel, we are using excess amount of methanol than stoichiometrically necessary. So let me describe uh, two possible solutions. The first technique is to use an uh, ultrasonic atomizer in order to generate very fine droplets of methanol and then to blend it with the oil. Basically what we are doing here is we are decoupling the droplet generation from the reactor, reactor operation, and as a result, we are freeing ourselves for a lot of the limitation of scale-up. Now, by ultrasonic atomization, we are obtaining droplets around 40 to 50 micron in diameter, and as a result, we are achieving a reaction rate which is 50 to, 50 to uh, I'm sorry, 10 to 50 times faster than in conventional reactors. Since now the reaction is much faster, the, reac the, uh, the action can be taken care can be done in a tubular reactor continuously. Further, since we are dealing now with a tubular reactor, the reactor can be maintained at higher temperature and pressure fairly easily. Just to show you a, a schematic diagram of the improvement, you can see here that in conventional, uh, we are plotting here the size of the reactor, the volume of the reactor, versus the reaction time that necessary to achieve a given conversion to biodiesel. And the bigger the reaction, you see that we need longer and longer time, and the, reaction, the reactor is, the volume is much, much larger, larger. When we are using the technique, the ultrasonic technique, you see that regardless of the size of the equipment, we can achieve a very short reaction time. Now, let me show you an, an, a, a schematic of an example for using the ultrasonic. Just imagine here that we have a, an ultrasonic atomizer. It vibrates vertically. We bet the size of the atomizer here with the, with the methanol or alcohol. As a result, we form here a plume of fine droplets. And on the side, we have here two gushes on plates of the oil, and as it falls down, it's, uh, they are mixed together and form the dispersion. Now, the process, in principle, will look something like that. Of course, we have the oil tank, the methanol tank. We are feeding them. That's the mixing tank where we make the, the, the dispersion. We are decirculating the mixture, and here we are introducing here the, the methanol, forming the droplets and we are recycling the dispersion. Now, we take the dispersion now, we are feeding it into a tubular reactor, we are heating it to the desired temperature, and since we can go now to higher temperature than the boiling, normal boiling 
temperature of methanol. Uh, we can maintain the reactor at, at elevated pressure. It comes here from, uh, from, from the reactor and we take the mixture here to a flash tank. We're reducing the pressure. The methanol evaporates. It's condensed here by air condenser and we recycle here. We add catalyst as necessary and it comes back to the feed plant. As far as the product here, the, the mixture of biodiesel, glycerin, or whatever is left, is now being fed into a separation tank, and we are separating it between the biodiesel and the glycerin. What are the main benefits that we obtain by this approach? First of all, we can operate the reactor at temperatures greater than 120 of, uh, degrees C, or 250 Fahrenheit. We can have very easily complete recovery of the unreacted methanol in the flash tank, and we don't need another unit to, to recover the, the methanol. Uh, we also uh, recognize, and we saw, that we have a much faster separation of the glycerin from the biodiesel because the methanol was, was removed. We have heat generation. Uh, I'm sorry, heat integration, as you see here, we're using the heat from the reactor to, to heat the feed that comes into the reactor. So we have efficient operation. And another possibility, because we're operating at high temperature and pressure, we probably can reduce the amount of the excess methanol that right now is being used in conventional processes. The second approach that we have is uh, to use the biodiesel itself as a co-solvent for the oil and the alcohol in order to form a homogeneous solution. Basically, what happened here is we recognized in a lab experiment that, whenever, that when we sprayed the uh, methanol into the, the mixture and the reaction was taking place, that after a while, the dispersion disappeared and we, came and we, we obtained a homogeneous solution. Well, if we have no problems of the two phases, the interfacial area between the two phases, we have no uh, transport limitation for the reaction setup. That are, I'm sorry. That no transport limitations that affect the reaction rate, and the reaction can be carried out as before in a tubular reactor and at elevated uh, temperature. We have, of course, to recognize that there is a, a processing cost for this approach, and the processing cost is that we will require a larger reactor volume due to the volume that is occupied by the solvent. So just to describe the process in, for this case is we have here again, we feed the methanol, we feed the oil, we have here a, a, a tank of the recycled biodiesel. We are fitting it all the three together to a, a static mixer, and we are forming here the homogeneous solution of the reacting fluid. Again, we are feeding it into the reactor, heating it up, and, and so forth. So everything else is the same as before, except that right now we are using the biodiesel as a solvent. Now, in the process itself is once we separate the, the alcohol, I'm sorry, the methanol, and we are taking the biodiesel and the glycerin, separate them easily, we take a, a portion of the biodiesel and recycle it to the biodiesel tank, which is used as a solvent. What, okay, the current status of, of the technology is that both techniques were demonstrated on a 15 gallons per, per hour of biodiesel pilot plant. In the pilot plan, we use the technique on soya bean oil, cotton seed oil, and corn oils. The reactor temperature in the pilot plan was limited by the heat capacity of the heater. And uh, we couldn't go beyond the 120 degrees C, but we believe that we, that can be done quite simply. The outlook, the reactor outlet streams was easily separated into the two phases, the biodiesel and the glycerol. And the status of the technology is the Texas Tech University right now is looking for a licensee for this technology. Okay, thank you very much for your interest, for your, for your attention. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, uh, Udo.
Susie. Appreciate, uh, appreciate that and uh, working through the technical difficulties there. Uh, <clears throat> we do have time for some questions. Cool. Uh, so uh, let's start, with, start back where we left off here. Uh, 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 question for, for Nicholas. Uh, Nick, does the single catalyst effectively combine the esterification and transesterification conversions, or, or does the catalyst simply ignore the FFAs? Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, the catalyst converts both the FFA and the oils into biodiesel, so it does not um, ignore the FFA. And what we found, it doesn't matter if you started with a zero FFA or a 70 FFA, the reaction times are the same, and the end product is 92% biodiesel, 7% mono, and 2% dyes all the time, every time. Okay, thanks, Nick. A question for Will. Will, what can you tell us about the uh, efficacy of microwave separation and cavitation technologies? Um, both of those I put in the category of, of process intensification, um, and there, there's been some application of, of both of those in you know, eating a few more percent yield out of, of a traditional uh, body supply. Um, particularly on separation, um, that one I haven't seen as, as much, uh, but there has been a lot of work done on, on all sorts of uh, process intensification techniques, uh, such as the one that Dr. Mann just discussed, um, which would make use of high shear mixers, ultrasonic mixers, uh, to accelerate traditional catalysis. All right, thank you. A uh, question for, for Dr. Mann. Uh, Uzi, what, what types of pressures are normal in, in your process? And uh, another related question is, uh, uh, does the tubular reactor at elevated temperatures require special materials of construction? Well, uh, since we operate at 150 degrees uh, C, in order to maintain the alcohol below the boiling point at 120 degrees C, we maintain the reactor at roughly at about uh, two to two and a half atmosphere. Okay, but this can be adjusted very easily by uh, modifying the opening of the valve at the outlet of the reactor. As far as the reactor, uh, no, the reactor was, was uh, uh, we used a three inch in diameter reactor made of steel and uh, uh, let, let me see, uh, metal carbon steel, right? Okay. Uh, Nicholas, can you please provide the net production cost, excluding feedstock price, for each of the types of feedstocks represented in your, in your presentation? Hello? Okay, well, uh, while we wait on that, uh, got a question for Per Monk. Uh, per Monk, can you recover the catalyst activity by inactivating mineral acids that are causing problems using caustic after the fact? Uh, no, we cannot. Uh, if there is uh, mineral acids in, the pH will has been low and it has denatured uh, the, the enzyme uh, protein. So you cannot uh, get it back uh, once it's uh, denatured by, by the acid. So we, we rather prevent the acid to charge it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nick, are you back with us? Yes, I just uh, jumped back on. Okay. Um, question I asked, can, can you please provide the net production cost excluding feedstock price for each of the types of feedstocks represented in your presentation? Um, I don't have the um, spreadsheet in front of me ready, but what I would suggest for the um, uh, person that asked this question uh, to uh, contact us um, directly and then we are more than happy to show uh, the numbers on each of these feedstocks. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, 
your biodiesel production cost will be very similar to a typical plant and using a, the PPMEC catalyst, uh, just keep in mind that um, you could save 10% more uh, on your catalyst cost. But everything else is pretty much the same. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Will, on your slide 11, uh, why is there additional methanol required for, say, the bi uh, sorry, for the Benefuel process? Yeah, I went back and looked at that. That's a little bit confusing. It's, I don't mean to imply that there is additional methanol required to complete uh, conversion of all the glycerides and, and uh, fatty acids. It, it, uh, excess methanol is required to drive the reaction to completion. That's what I'm intending to say there. So the overall mass balance is the same. Uh, the, the reaction we consume the same amount of methanol uh, as any other catalytic process would. Um, it's the, the excess methanol used to drive the reaction to completion is, is higher in the case of heterogeneous catalysts and supercritical than for other processes. All right, thank you. Um, per monk, what, what would be the maximum amount of unsup uh, unsaponifiable material uh, this technology can deal with your uh, Novozymes and enzymatic production? I don't think I give a specific answer. And that, uh, I mean, the, the unsaponifiable was just uh, pass through the reaction, uh, so to speak, on unconverted, uh, of course, uh, and will be be in the biodiesel after our reaction. It does not, as such, uh, interfere with the enzyme. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, will, uh, can you provide an average capex uh, for each of the current pr uh, production technologies that you represented? That may be something that who the questioner may, uh, the asker may want to uh, submit to you individually since we're, we're limited on time here, but if you've got a comment on that. Yeah, I mean, depending upon the provider and the scale, um, your CapEx for, I'm, I'm guessing they're referring to the, the different pretreatment technologies. Um, these are going to vary widely, uh, really dependent upon scale and what, what is included in, in the scope. I mean, the traditional rule of thumb is, is uh, you know, a dollar per gallon for, per, uh, you know, installed capacity for traditional transit verification plants, and that's usually a, a medium scale, uh, you know, 10 to 15 million gallons per year. It, it could be substantially higher uh, if you're you're talking about including things like acid sterification or biodiesel distillation on the back end. So that, that would be something I'd have to address uh, offline. All right, thank you. Uh, question for Nicholas. Uh, does the amount of PPMEC catalyst change depending on the free fatty acid percentage of the oil? Um, no, it does not. Uh, it's the same uh, dosage, whether it's 0% or 70% FFA. Uh, another question for, for Nicholas. Um, can, can the PPMEC catalyst be recovered and reused, and if not, does it affect glycerin sales price or present other disposal cost slash issues? Um, being um, the cost of the PPMEC um, is, is is low. Uh, the overall usage is very low because you don't dose a lot of it um, in the process. So we didn't see a need to recover that uh, and reuse it. Uh, it's very much like uh, your sodium methylate process where you use it and you let it um, uh, settle down in your glycerin. Now, at, at a, a thousand ppm of dosage um, of the PPMEC, there is very little effect on the quality of the uh, glycerin and it will not affect any uh, down um, uh, refining uh, activities. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've got a few more questions here. We're, I know we're cutting close on time. Per monk, uh, what is the production yield uh, uh, per pound of enzyme? Uh, typical uh, enzyme use, you will need uh, something like two to two and a half pound of uh, enzyme per, per pound of, uh, per, sorry, 
Two, I'm I'm confused on this pound and, and gallon still. I'm sorry. Two kilogram of enzyme per tons of biodiesel. That's a, that is a typical number we're working with. Okay. Thank you, um, Nick. Question: um, When will you be able to start selling the catalyst if you had an or order tomorrow? Well, um, <clears throat> we have uh, partnered up with a a large specialty chemical company to manage uh, manufacture the catalyst for us uh, in North America, and it will be uh, available worldwide. And for shipments, you know, count on we are able to um, uh, sell these catalysts in uh, in three months or so. Okay, great. Um, you know, we we've uh, really received a uh, a wealth of questions. Uh, Sorry, we're not going to be able to get to uh, all of them. Of course, uh, most of our presenters had uh, had their uh, uh, contact information uh, up on their presentations, so we encourage you to uh, reach out to them. Did want to bring uh, all of our attendees uh, uh, bring your attention to a uh, special discount, two hundred fifty dollars discount that uh, you can receive on registration for the National Advanced Biofuels Conference and Expo. It's going to be uh, October 13th and 14th in Minneapolis. We're going to have uh, quite a bit of biodiesel and renewable uh, diesel information in the educational sessions. We're going to have a lot of attendees. Uh, producers, of course, are going to get free, registr or free registration to the conference. So um, if, uh, you know, if you're looking to go to a conference this fall and you want uh, it to involve biodiesel and renewable diesel, we uh, encourage you to Register at advancedbiofuelsconference.com and uh, use the promo code webinar to receive, a, as an attendee of this webinar, a $250 discount. We would like to uh, thank our webinar sponsor, Methes Energy, one last time. Thank you, uh, Methes Energy, for sponsoring this webinar. And finally, we want to bring your attention to a webinar that we're going to be hosting on September 25th, it's going to be Biodiesel Magazine's editorial outlook for 2015. Uh, we're going to be um, covering all of the 2015 Biodiesel Magazine issues, uh, themes of, of the issue, and our departments. And so if your company uh, has relied on or plans to use Biodiesel Magazine to promote your service, equipment, or offering to the biodiesel industry. We uh, encourage you to uh, attend this webinar on September 25th. Thanks again uh, to Methes Energy, and uh, this now concludes our broadcast. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.